Hey everybody, this is Brent with LabM12, and this is part two of our mask our scene and tutorial series. In the last video, we showed you how to set up your environment and then access your Jupyter notebook across a network to a remote server. And so now in this video, we're going to show you actually how to train your model. So if we access our notebook and go into train.ipynb, then we can see all the code for how to train our mask our scene and model. So first, we're going to import our dependencies which includes things from uh, the Cocoa libraries, Mascar CNN, and some miscellaneous things like operating system, system, uh, JSON, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We're also gonna set some constants. So depending on what data set you're training on will determine um, how many classes you're gonna have. Classes is basically the categories of things that you're gonna be training. For instance, if I wanna train a model to recognize uh, cats, dogs, and houses, then that would be three classes. Um, you could have more, you could have less, but in our case, uh, the data set that we're training on has small structures, medium structures, and other. So we will be using three classes. If you specify a path to a .h5 weights file, um, this basically means that you're refining on a data set, right? So if I had uh, some pre-existing model, I want to train it a little bit farther, that's what we mean by refining. Um, that's often related to things like transfer learning, but for our case, we're going to be uh, training from scratch. But you can, in fact, uh, load an H5 file and have that loaded into the model and then refine on those weights. You need to specify the path to uh, your train, uh, your training annotations JSON file. So in our case, it's in datasets downtown slice train annotation split dot JSON. Um, this is just where we have it. Again, you could have it wherever you want, but this is just the path and then conversely uh, specify the path to its image directory. So you do the same thing with validation. For anybody that's ever worked with deep learning, um, this actually might be kind of confusing because typically you just have a train set and, and uh, a test set. In this case, we have a train, validation, and test set. So the way that mask RCNN works is as you're training, after you uh, complete an epoch or basically one step through the data set, it's going to run through the validation uh, data set for a specified number of steps and basically calculate another loss function that way. So that's why we need to have another data set. So then we uh, specify the number of epochs that we want to train on. In this case, we're going to do 80. Um, this is pretty much just up to your discretion. Uh, typically, if you train uh, too much, then you can overfit your model. So you kind of have to be careful about not overtraining. We found that uh, 80 is a good baseline for us for this particular data set. And so we're going to give it a name. I'm just going to call it test model. So under additional setup, basically these lines uh, aren't going to change unless, of course, you want them to. Um, what we're really concerned about is this line right here. So CUDA visible devices will basically tell TensorFlow, or in this case, uh, tactic, well, so we're using Keras, but TensorFlow is under the hood. This line will specify what graphics cards are available to your model. So it's, it's a pretty well-known issue that MaskR CNN uh, for the TensorFlow version does not scale well across multiple GPUs. And so we've basically took this problem um, and tried to turn it into lemonade, so to speak. Um, so we have four GPUs on our cluster. And so if we can specify, hey, train a model on this specific GPU, then we can do that times four. Um, so this is what allows us to train models a lot faster. And so just to kind of explain what I'm talking about, I'll set this to one, and then we'll see that when we start training our model, it's only uh, the there's GPU zero, one, two, three, four, one will be activated and actually doing something. Next, we're going to declare our training configuration. Um, again, uh, a lot of these things you can change. Most of them you probably will not. Um, the one thing that you do want to keep in mind is the fact uh, that your image dimensions could change, right? So in our particular data set, the smallest side for an image is 1,152 pixels, and the largest is 1,280. Um, and these numbers need to be divisible by two, six times. I can't really explain why, but that's just one of the requirements of 
uh, mask our scene in. It has to do with how the images are, uh, you know, go through the convolution process and then are upscaled again multiple times. Um, that number has to specify that requirement. Here's where we'll tell it uh, basically how many steps to go through per epoch. We're going to do 180 and then 50 validation steps. Here we can also specify what kind of uh, feature extraction backbone we want to use. Uh, Matterport is built in with either ResNet 50 or ResNet 101. Again, we'll leave links to uh, some of the papers regarding these models because uh, we're not going to go into them in this video, but here's basically just saying you know, where you specify what backbone you want to use, and we're going to use ResNet 101. We can then display our configuration to make sure everything's okay. And then create a class to load our data set. So again, we're using a Cocoa formatted data set. So we've modified the original way that MaskRCNN uh, takes in data from a data set and makes it work better for a Cocoa data set. We're then going to create uh, objects for our train and validation data sets where we first uh, create Cocoa-like data set, we call, call this class, and then specify our annotations uh, and our image directories. So we'll let that load. And then we can build our mask our scene in model. We're going to build it in training mode, and then specify our training config, and then our model directory. Cool. And once that's done, then, like I mentioned above, uh, had we have specified a weights file uh, earlier, this is where uh, it would be loaded in. Um, in this case, we don't have a weights file that we're loading in. We're not uh, trying to refine a set of weights, so that gets ignored. And then um, we can actually start training our model. So this will tell you um, basically when it's done, how long it took for the model to train. Um, we're going to train on all of the layers pass in the number of epochs, the learning rate, um, and our train and validation data sets. And so now we can see some of the metrics that, um, that this framework is giving us. So it first shows us, well, here's all the layers in the network that I'm going to train. And then TensorFlow is going to give us some warnings, but don't worry about this. This doesn't really mean anything. And then in a second here, uh, it'll basically say uh, epoch 1 of 80, and then it'll start training. And now we're training. And so we see that we're on epoch 1 of 80. Uh, we're about 10 steps into 180 steps for this epoch. And then we can see some uh, various metrics, various uh, loss related metrics. We can also get an estimated time of arrival for when this particular epoch is going to complete. Um, and then we do that 80 more times. So while this is running, I'll show you what I mean by um, uh, that CUDA environment flag uh, that I set earlier. So if I SSH back into my cluster, and I type in NVIDIA SMI, then we can see all of our GPUs. And just like how I set the flag to be um, GPU number one, I basically told the model only train on this GPU. And so we can see that reflected in how hard uh, all of my GPUs are working. Number one is going at 66%. And this number changes rapidly. So we can see now it's at 99%. It just it fluctuates uh, every now and then. So we'll come back in a bit whenever this model is done. Um, I also wanted to point out that we have uh, some evaluation scripts also built into this train, um, this uh, training script, and you don't have to use these. The reason that we put this in here is because of the way that we were conducting research with mask our scene in. We were uh, we were basically modifying some of the layers of the mask generation portion of the network, and so what happens in a Jupyter notebook is uh, you for instance, we loaded up this notebook, and even if I were to go back into like the deep parts of MaskRCNN and uh, and change it and save it, 
it won't recognize those changes unless I reload the kernel. Basically, so I would go into here uh, and click, uh, it says restart with kernel with dialog. Um, and so in our case, we were training multiple models at the same time um, and didn't want to have to go through that process of, um, you know, well now like this model has trained, so I need to go back, change the layers, restart the kernel. So this just kind of helped us with our workflow. However, you don't need this. And it's in fact the exact same as the evaluation script that I'm going to show you in the next video, part three. So thanks again for tuning in. Uh, part three is going to be how we can use this model to actually run inferencing. So we'll feed some pictures through it uh, and see what kind of output we get. Uh, and then part four will be uh, evaluating our script and seeing how well it does. So thanks again. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.